Good morning from Miami Beach. This is Dr. John Bennett. I can't go to this beach. We've got the uh, quarantine. But we have the pleasure today of having Abilash Haridas, a pediatric neurosurgeon from Tampa. And I'll let him launch right into his uh, presentation. Good morning, Abilash. Morning, John. Thank you. Thank you, Ipe Hira, for all organizing this. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, here we go. So I'm in Tampa. Um, we're going to be talking about Moya Moya. We'll jump right into it. Uh, so Moya Moya is a progressive uh, uh, stenosis of the uh, intracranial internal carotid arteries and their uh, proximal branches. Uh, the incidence is slightly higher in the uh, um, Japanese population, but it's also uh, quite common in, in many other uh, parts of the world, including the Mediterranean. <clears throat> When you have a uh, moya moya, it can be idiopathic in many cases, uh, but there are also many conditions that are associated with moya moya. And these are a list of the conditions. Um, here, uh, NF1 sickle cell and Down syndrome are probably the three most commonest uh, 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 reasons to have moya moya. I'm not saying every patient who has these conditions will develop moya moya, but when you see these patients in your clinic, uh, you should have a slightly higher uh, 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 suspicion, especially if they come in with uh, stroke-like symptoms, that Moya Moya is a possible diagnosis. Some of the ones on the bottom are more, uh, they can be associated, but uh, they're not as common uh, conditions. One thing over here, postcranial radiation. We know radiation can cause uh, 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 alterations in blood flow, and uh, if someone has had radiation, especially brain tumors as uh, children, and they've had multiple radiations over their lifetime, they can develop moya moya. So just something to think about. Now, what happens in moya moya? It's not, uh, it's where, it, there's a hyperplasia of the uh, smooth muscle that occurs here. And, uh, and this causes the uh, blood to, uh, uh, this impedes the blood flow causing the uh, stroke to, to happen. Uh, sickle cell disease is a slightly different, uh, it's an inherited condition that can lead to moya moya, and it's, uh, it can cause uh, multiple uh, uh, problems with the blood flow in various parts of the body, the lung being one of the most commonest in the bone, but when they happen in the brain, they can lead to strokes, and uh, bone marrow transplant has emerged as a, a very potential uh, uh, cure for some of these debilitating uh, diseases. Specifically with sickle cell disease, uh, uh, transcranial Dopplers uh, can be done on a six month or yearly basis. And when you have an increase in velocity, you have almost a 40% chance, especially when your velocities are over 200 centimeters a second. So sometimes we use this when we are uh, uh, talking uh, to uh, patients and what their stroke risk is. The uh, important thing about uh, the important thing about uh, the asymptomatic patient, what do you do when someone really doesn't have a stroke but they've been diagnosed with moya moya? Th there's no real clear screening guidelines. Um, they, you have to uh, really uh, uh, probably watch those patients uh, uh, a little bit more closely uh, and give them reassurance initially. And you may or may not uh, want to treat them with aspirin um, uh, or even refer them to a hematologist for for their work workup. But a majority of the patients with sickle cell disease will have radiographic progression of their moya moya. Now, radiographic progression does not mean that they will have symptoms. So it's very clear to make that distinction. Only about 10% uh, of patients will make, uh, uh, will have symptoms. So uh, this is called the IV sign where you have these flare, and this, is a T, this is a flare study showing the T2 hyperintensity around the sulcus. And this is usually uh, a very uh, good sign to look for if uh, someone is uh, potentially going to have a stroke. The Suzuki grading system, uh, I'm not gonna go into detail, but this is an angiographic uh, evaluation for uh, Moya Moya and uh, now, now uh, a more uh, updated uh, Berlin grading, you can read this in a uh, 
uh, uh, stroke paper from a couple of years ago uh, where they looked at MR perfusion studies to grade Moya Moya. So this is a more updated uh, and recent uh, grading system. So of course, whenever these patients come in before surgery, doing a good preoperative assessment is important because you need to ensure that they don't have a stroke or a hemorrhage post-op and you've lost function. And it's also good to keep track of your outcomes moving forward. Neuropsychology assessment, uh, MRA, angiogram, um, you can also get a, a cerebral angiogram in these cases, or just a plain MRA if the patient cannot tolerate a cerebral angiogram. SPEC studies, uh, these are not done in all cases all over the world, uh, but many centers that do perform this on a regular basis. And if you're dealing with sickle cell kids in particular, they should get transfusions, uh, preferably within a few days of their surgery being done. So the types of uh, <clears throat> MRAs are, are different in different institutions. It depends on what kind of machine you have, if you have a Hitachi or a, or a Philips. And uh, this is a uh, time-resolved MRA where you can see uh, uh, it catches the arterial and venous phase uh, uh, quite well. And sometimes this is all you need to give you the diagnosis uh, of Moya Moya, and, and you can move forward with treatment. This is an example of an axial view of an MRA showing complete occlusion of the, uh, of the carotids bilaterally. This patient does not have the lenticular strite uh, uh, hyperintensity or, or vessels that you would normally see. So this is a very late stage uh, Moya Moya. This is an example of what the IV sign looks like. I mentioned earlier where you had the flare changes on both sides of a sulcus. Uh, so this uh, designates uh, uh, patients that are slightly higher risk of developing strokes. And in this angiogram, you can see the, uh, the vessels, uh, the, the puff of smoke uh, vessels that is uh, uh, classically, that's exactly what moya moya means in, in Japanese, puff of smoke. So why, why, what are we really trying to achieve? We're trying to uh, you know, prevent thrombosis, prevent a stroke. So you wanna keep these patients very well hydrated. And uh, if they have preoperative symptoms such as headaches or seizures, you want to address that and see if you can uh, mitigate those symptoms with medication prior to even considering any surgery. So surgery is really not the first option. You wanna to try to see if you can, you can uh, control their symptoms and, and uh, wait till they develop a, a um, worsening of symptoms. So when, when I think about these cases, especially uh, you, you have to take a step back uh, and not think of this as moya moya, but think of, of the entire uh, uh, philosophy of this talk is flow. You are trying to get flow to the brain where the brain needs it. So how do you get flow there? Sometimes you have a stenosis of the carotid in the neck and you have to replace flow to the entire brain. Uh, you open up flow in the neck and, and, and that happens. If you have a big aneurysm, your goal there is to replace the entire flow to that hemisphere if you're gonna take the aneurysm and take the carotid. So that's called a flow replacement. In Moya Moya, it's flow augmentation. It's very different. Flow augmentation means you're just promoting you're trying to create a way for the brain to get blood through alternate means. So you're not replacing it completely but over time, the flow will increase. So it's a much more gradual process and it takes time. So you have to first identify uh, what your goals of treatment are. So Moya Moya is a flow augmentation procedure. It is not a flow replacement procedure. So very important to have that very clear understanding and tell the patients that uh, uh, very clearly when you uh, speak with them because uh, uh, they may feel uh, the same after surgery, and that's 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 okay. But uh, they they will definitely notice some improvement, especially in their cognitive skills or memory. Um, I've had many patients, especially with their memory, improve over time. So that's really what we're going for. That's a goal. It's a long-term goal, not the immediate uh, effect that we're looking for. So before surgery, uh, you know, around you know, you should have very clear conversations with your anesthesiologist. Uh, uh, I maintain no more carbia, no. Uh, and normal thermia, at all costs, you want to avoid hypotension. Uh, that is a bad situation. Um, and of course, controlling your blood loss. So these are not very bloody cases, but with bad technique, you can lose a lot of blood. Uh, aspirin is continued, uh, is, is started well before surgery, and it's one of the few 
surgeries where we actually continue it. We don't stop it. If a patient has forgotten his dose of aspirin, you can give it to him per oral, or you can give it per rectal, 325, and that's completely acceptable. The fluids are kept at one and a half to one and a quarter of maintenance, and this is maintained for about two days post-op. And I usually started the day before surgery. In some centers, you would have to admit the patient uh, prior to surgery, um, but this is also uh, important uh, when it comes to uh, uh, getting patients uh, well hydrated uh, so they tolerate the surgery well. Uh, pain control, this is more of an issue with children. Uh, when they uh, wake up from surgery and they uh, are in pain, they can hyperventilate and that can cause vasoconstriction and uh, you know, your bypass can potentially have the chance of, uh, of failing. So it's, it's something that is not really uh, a surgeon's uh, fault, but it's also uh, paying attention to what happens in the perioperative period is just as important as your surgery. And uh, in general, I use uh, absorbable sutures on the younger children uh, just because, uh, uh, you know, I'm tired of uh, hearing them scream when you take them out. So over the years, I've just resorted to this. It's a much more, uh, uh, it's much more bearable for both uh, the doctor and the patient. So one, uh, um, this is a paper into, from 2008, uh, Dr. Charbel, uh, Dr. Hanjani and the team at Chicago. I had the honor and pleasure of training under him and he's uh, given, you know, uh, taught me a bypass surgery uh, 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 when I was a fellow with him. And they developed this concept of cut flow index where you, uh, I will show you where we do this in one of the videos coming up, where when you cut the uh, superficial temporal artery, you measure the, the, the flow within the superficial temporal artery. And after your bypass to your middle cerebral artery, you measure the you divide these two numbers and you get an index. If your index is over, point, over 0.5, then there's a likelihood that your bypass is going to have a very good long-term patency rate. And if your uh, cut flow index is under 0.5, then you have developed a, a potential error. And these are the type of errors you can get. First and foremost, poor indication. You probably didn't think, uh, you, or you probably falsely assumed the patient had moya moya and you thought a bypass would help. Um, so, you know, sometimes these are things we, we learn in retrospect, like many things in medicine. It's uh, very evident now in the, uh, in the time of COVID, how many things we're learning on the fly. Uh, we have a lot of things we understand about Moya Boya, but sometimes you wonder, why did my patient have a stroke in spite of having a fall of surgery, or why did they have a hemorrhage? Um, and the type two errors are mostly technical problems, where you uh, may have a problem with the donor, your vessel is a problem. You may have a problem with the anastomosis where you, uh, uh, you do not put enough stitches or there's bleeding from the anastomosis. Stitches or there's bleeding. And uh, the third issue is the recipient. The recipient may not be healthy and I'll show you one example of that one of the videos coming up. So positioning. Uh, when you position the patient, um, I've seen uh, uh, this surgery uh, performed by multiple surgeons and uh, uh, usually we are, uh, you can put the patient in pins, the, the Sugita uh, clamp or the Mayfield clamp. Uh, uh, but uh, if you notice here, this patient, this is the right cheek, this is the right ear. This is a, uh, a view from the back. And uh, this is the outline of the superficial temporal artery. And, and this patient is laying on just a foam donut. Just a, and usually I put a, a sh small shoulder bump underneath the ipsilateral shoulder to just give the neck some relaxation so there's no uh, uh, restriction of venous outflow. And these are small but subtle points to keep in mind because uh, they will not only keep the patient and uh, your anesthesiologist happy, but also it gives you the comfort you need to do this. Remember, this, this surgery takes some time. So the more comfortable you are, the most likely you're going to have very good success with your bypass strategy and skills. So this is something I've um, it's not something people tell you, but when you hear it once, hopefully it'll take, it'll take effect. So this, this girl had a craniopharyngioma uh, many, many uh, years ago and had multiple bouts of very strong radiation. She fortunately did not have a recurrence 10 years later, but you can see the scar from her bifrontal craniotomy, but she developed severe moya moya on that side, and that's the reason why we did this surgery. So, uh, 
so that's the reason why I, I you know when you you want to avoid neck rotation you want to use a clamp i i don't use the clamp because i worry about injuring the contralateral uh, sta or uh, 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 posterior auricular artery in case the patient is bilateral and if the patient has had surgery on the prior side i worry that i may injure that craniotomy no matter how many years it's been? So it's it's more of a uh, it's more of a philosophical approach I have, but there's nothing wrong if you pin the patient. So I just want to make that very clear. And 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 if you're going to pin the patient, uh, be very careful of where the pins go so you don't injure the contral STA. You may need that in the future, so uh, don't don't burn all your bridges. So options, direct and indirect bypass. This alone, this slide alone, we can talk for a couple of hours because this this. Uh, Debate is, uh, uh, you know, as interesting uh, as uh, you know, it's, it's like it's like talking about uh, clipping and coiling the, the and having a debate about it. But it, it is all it, it's important to be flexible. Um, in pediatric patients, generally indirect bypass is preferred. In adult patients, uh, uh, direct bypass is preferred. Um, uh, and if you have the ability to do both, uh, that is. Uh, uh, some of the more recent literature, especially out of uh, uh, Berlin, you can read there's a stroke paper, paper from Wykowski and colleagues in 2018 and published in Stroke where uh, they showed a benefit, especially in all age groups for patients that have had both, uh, have had the direct and the indirect bypass and because the direct bypass over time gives you very, very uh, a good augmentation of blood flow uh, to the hemisphere that's involved. Now, when you look at the uh, the uh, superficial temporal artery, it, uh, it's a it's a terminal branch of the external carotid artery, and you can see here this is the uh, internal maxillary artery, and that it's not shown on this video on this picture, but the middle meningeal artery comes uh, pretty much in this location, and uh, makes a, a slight hairpin turn on your angiogram. So that's how you. Uh, you, uh, you identify the middle meningeal artery. So you don't want to confuse that for your superficial temporal artery, which is roughly about a centimeter away. So it's important to just have that concept. Sometimes you can, you know, it's always a good idea to have a, a very good working relationship with your, uh, if you're not an endovascular person and you don't, you don't have, uh, you don't see these uh, uh, scans or angiograms that much, uh, just have a conversation with them. There's a lot of anatomy you can learn just by looking at these scans. This is the super, super, superficial temporal artery parietal branch and, and frontal branch. And uh, this is uh, the bifurcation can be very close to the zygomatic root, or it can be also slightly higher. And sometimes you only have one branch and you don't have the other branch. So all multiple things. Um, uh, sometimes the frontal branch can come up and split posteriorly into, into larger branch. So you can take one vessel and uh, multiply it by three and then to three bypasses. So these are all things to uh, really consider. So uh, just like any neurosurgical procedure you do, uh, anatomy is uh, the, the foundation of, of, of everything that we do in surgery. So the more you uh, repeat the anatomy, and just like surgery, you'll get better at it. And, and you want to confirm your, your uh, anatomical knowledge during surgery and, and uh, and have an aha moment if, if you say, oh yeah, I knew that uh, extra branch was gonna be there. So I'm gonna show these, uh, I'm going through these slides uh, just to give you some pointers, but I'm gonna reiterate it during the videos so you'll have a very clear understanding. You always wanna dissect along the vessel when you're taking out the, uh, um, the STA. You wanna dissect parallel to the vessel. You don't wanna go, you don't wanna go, uh, you wanna go along the vessel because if you go beside the vessel, you can, you can tear off the branches and that can make your fleet feel bloody and potentially you can injure the uh, superficial temporal artery. If you're using a, collar, uh, a bovi uh, by, uh, uh, to, to cauterize, make sure it's on a very low setting, around eight or 10, and use a Colorado tip, which is a needle point. Don't use a broad tip because you wanna be very, very fine. Uh, it's, uh, so you, it's not, you're not painting it with a brush. You, you're doing very fine strokes right over the vessel. Extremely important, and uh, I'm I'm telling you this because uh, I've injured the vessel, and it, it's it's very very disheartening when that happens, and it's purely technique. So, uh, very important to keep that in mind. Uh, Doppler frequently. If you're beginning to do this, use your Doppler. Don't don't be shy. Uh, just if you hear it, then you can see it, and then you proceed forward. 
I start usually distally in the head and then go uh, proximal. Uh, you can start in the middle and go that way too, but uh, I like to, to go distal and, and work my way proximal. And uh, you can use skin markings. You can mark directly over the skin. Uh, and uh, you, do, you should not use any injection or use uh, local anesthesia because you can obviously injure the superficial temporal artery, which is your friend in this case uh, and, and not your foe. So this is a uh, video. I'm gonna go through this uh, to give you those steps. This is a young boy. Uh, he's about uh, just under two years. You can see we're out, this is the right side. Um, we're outlining the frontal branch of the superficial temporal artery and then the parietal branch. You can see there's a branch coming up here. Um, and uh, this is just outlining the parietal branch. Of the, and I used this to plan my craniotomy. He had both uh, uh, ACA and MCA territory infarctions. And this is, the, this is under the microscope. I, I do the dissection on the microscope. This is a, a technique um, um, I learned from uh, Professor Tanikawa in Sapporo, uh, who is a, a fantastic uh, a vascular surgeon. And uh, you can see the superficial temporal artery coming into view and going right next to it and then bipolaring it and, and, and basically uh, moving it away from the vessel. This is the other technique where you use a, a, a bovi and you come directly over the vessel. The reason you want it under a low setting is because if you have it under a high setting, it'll transmit through your uh, uh, mosquito into the vessel and damage the vessel. That's why you want it at a low setting. And uh, now we have exposed the, the STA. We, uh, we slowly start to uh, come uh, posteriorly. Uh, again, you, uh, this is going right next to the vessel. Uh, take your time. You wanna use your uh, bipolar uh, carefully, you don't wanna just burn everything because if you burn everything, you're basically burning the skin edges and you will have a post-operative infection or wound breakdown. This is a, a, a rule for any neurosurgical case, but even more important with these cases. Uh, you know, Respect the tissues and, and they will respect you back. So once this is done, you can release it, uh, the STA. You can, you can see this in my left hand is a atraumatic forcep. Uh, so if someone gives you a, a tooth forcep, <laughs> just happened before. Um, uh, please don't use it because you will damage the vessel. And now we have harvested the STA. So now we are extending our incision anteriorly up to widow's peak. And uh, these are just rainy clips to uh, control bleeding. And uh, this is now bringing your musculocutaneous flap anteriorly. These are fish hooks. And now I'm protecting the STA under and posteriorly and both branches have been harvested, okay? Now this is a young child, so you can see the temporalis muscle is very thin. We, uh, I saved this temporalis muscle for the end of the case to promote the indirect bypass, which is the uh, uh, myosynangiosis. I'm making a burr hole. You can see that skull is a very, very thin. Be careful here. This is where your bypass, your vessels are. So you see my drill is very close to it. Uh, uh, I would definitely have someone protect the vessel so you don't catch the vessel in your drill. Um, drills are very good, but they're also very dangerous in the, in the wrong area. These are dural tack-up sutures to prevent any uh, epidural bleeding. Um, and now we are opening the uh, dura. The dura is opened, uh, is tailored. You don't, if the patient has, a, this, is a, this is the dura being uh, flipped underneath to promote the indirect uh, bypass. And here I, I'm trying to preserve the middle meningeal artery. And uh, again, making a triangle around there to uh, promote the um, indirect bypass. Now, uh, this is the frontal branch that uh, we are seeing now. Um, when, when you, uh, it's the same technique. You can use a scissor. I'm showing you all these uh, different techniques because you, you develop your style. You don't have to do it this way all the time, but whatever works fastest, and you have to be efficient. You don't want to spend all day doing this because you have to, you still have to do the bypass, which is going to take more of your attention and your energy. So uh, try to be as efficient in this part of the, of the case, but be safe also. Now, once the vessel is harvested, it is very important to, uh, again, this is all done under the microscope. So you should have very clear understanding of the anatomy. This is taking the adventitia off of the uh, vessel. Uh, have an assistant hold it to give you some counter traction. A lot of irrigation. You can see the irrigation coming on. We're using a, a pen just to mark it and then of course fish mouthing it. 
Uh, try to be very gentle with the tips. This is a 27 gauge needle to in, infuse the interior of the vessel with the heparinized saline, about 10 units per ml. Now we have both vessels exposed. Now the dura has been opened. Uh, taking out the arachnoid uh, is important. You, this is just a piece of glove, the glove that you use, just use that. There's other multiple uh, uh, materials that can be used, but I, I found this very, it's, it's cheap and you can use it pretty much anytime. Some people don't even use a, a, a rubber dam. So again, be flexible. Uh, that's, that is the uh, thing with bypass surgery. Just do what you feel comfortable. But these are just to tell you there are options you have. This is uh, isolating an M4 branch on the cortical surface. Now this is 11 blade. Um, you can use something smaller like a needle and, and make your opening in the vessel. And now we're doing the heel and, uh, and toe stitch. This is the, uh, this is the toe stitch. This is a 10 o needle, uh, BV753. Uh, I'll show you that in one of the slides coming up. And once you do the heel and toe stitch, you can, you can tie this down. And uh, again, uh, I use the microscope and do this under high magnification. And, and I you also use the foot pedal and the mouth switch. Uh, this is purely uh, something habitual. If you enjoy uh, using the mouth switch, go ahead. Uh, but if you don't, then then please don't. That's the, this is your maybe you're not going you're comfortable with. When you get bat, when you get bleeding like this after the bypass, that's actually a good sign. That means there's blood flowing through there. Uh, it's better than having no flow. But it can be very easily controlled with just some irrigation. And then you can see this has a. Uh, you're taking out the final clip, and this should have like a, the appearance of a, either a, a like a cobra head or like a, an elephant's paw. You pick your analogy. And, and that's kind of what we are looking for. Now, similarly, uh, we picked the other, this is an AVM clip, again, opening up. You can see the vessel is very, very translucent. When you're doing this maneuver with the scissor, don't be aggressive because if you push too hard, you can go right through the back wall. And um, I, I've, I've seen salvage techniques for that, but trust me, it, it just um, adds another uh, potentially 10, 15 minutes of, of pain in your life. Um, and, and, and it makes you uh, probably a little bit more tired uh, and you want to kind of get through these cases and have good outcomes and move on, move on to the next case. So again, an, uh, like a cobra head uh, appearance and then we're checking this with the Charbel flow probe. I did not show you the cut flow um, uh, measurements, but uh, this is uh, uh, how it's done. This is an ICG uh, run. I'm going to show you this is the flow going into the ICG and then I'm massaging the other one to see if the flow comes through. So, um, let me go back a second. Yeah, so this is taking, this is where we take off the temporalis muscle and we suture it directly to the inferior part of the, remember, right, this is the right side, right ear is here. And we use that to do the indirect, by, the indirect bypass. So this is the EDAMS portion. Make sure you have a generous opening, especially in the, the temporal part, that will be where your bypass comes in. And because this is a young child, I use sutures to close. And of course, standard skin closure. And I leave a drain almost always to very low suction. So <clears throat> I'm gonna be showing you some more videos coming up, but just wanna reiterate, we aspirin is kept the whole time. We don't stop it. You want to maintain the, the fluids at one and a half or 1.25 maintenance. If you have an elderly person um, uh, with some mild congestive heart failure, better not to drown them with fluid prior to surgery. That's not a good idea. So use your judgment. Again, study your patient and explain to them why you're doing what you're doing. And um, everyone gets an arterial line, Foley catheter. These are, not, these are not very bloody cases. These are not cases where you lose and you need to give transfusions unless if that's happening, then your technique is off. Um, you, you should not be losing a ton of blood, especially with moya moya bypass. They're supposed to be very clean cases. And um, uh, it's not like tackling an AVM where you can have these swings and ebbs and flows. So, and uh, definitely no local anesthesia. I put up this slide to just give you an idea of how um, the, 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 the people have asked me many times, how much do you give? Uh, uh, um, you know, um, it depends if I take care of children and adults with moya moya. So if you have a child, you want to use 10 per kg of aspirin or, or an adult, you can use a baby aspirin or even 325. Heparinized saline, you can have your pharmacist make this the day prior or the morning of. 
and make sure it's 10 units per ml, have a half a liter bag hanging somewhere. Uh, so you have free access to it during the entire case. Paparin, it comes, at least in the USA, it comes in 60 milligram and 2 ml vial. And you want that diluted in about uh, 40 cc's of saline. And uh, bolus the patient with, uh, with uh, uh, Keppra or phosphonitoin uh, to make sure they don't have seizures post-op. Just like anything in neurosurgery, your only um, your skill is only as good as uh, your efficiency in using the tools. Uh, these are uh, this is from Dr. Shaker's paper in 2007. This is a uh, flexible uh, suction. You can put that in multiple areas. This is more uh, useful. These long instruments for uh, deeper bypasses. If you're planning to go uh, doing a, like a P2 or a, a, a ST, uh, STA M2 bypass for aneurysm. Uh, but for Moya Moya, you're mostly working on the surface. You don't need long instruments. So have short instruments. That's what I prefer. Um, I think if the closer you are to the, the field, the more stability you have in your hand. Um, you, when you make your anastomosis cut, and you'll see this in the upcoming video, you want to make it uh, at a 60 degree angle and have it about three and a half times the width of the, uh, uh, the, uh, width of the uh, vessel that you're anastomosing to. The instruments you use are extremely important, like I mentioned earlier, but also the suture. You know, I use the 75-3. You can also use a 90 uh, BV-104. These are very fine sutures, uh, and they're also expensive. So uh, you want to really uh, try to utilize the suture to its maximum and not waste it. Um, these, are, uh, these can easily go up your suction when you're suctioning, so it's very common to lose them during the case. Uh, these are the Kamiyama scissors. This is from the Mizuho. This is, uh, I forget which company, but uh, these are all like diamond coated. And this gives you the grip you need to hold your needle and, uh, and, and give you the, 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 the dexterity and the uh, agility to do these bypasses very, very clean and efficiently. This is a uh, um, uh, demonstration of indirect bypass where we make a temporal craniotomy and we just find the STA, we leave it in continuity and we uh, directly place it, this is the dura open. You can see the, mid, the middle meningeal artery branches on the dural surface. This is just some surgical. Again, you want a nice clean feel. And uh, once the dura is open, we lay it uh, directly onto the uh, pia and then use a tenno suture to uh, directly suture it. The best place to uh, suture it is right where the uh, arachnoid meets the pia, the arachnoid pia interface. That's where the arachnoid is more tough. You don't want to suture it on the arachnoid over a vessel. That's where it thins out. Uh, this is this way your, your vessel will actually lay down where it's supposed to lay down, not just bounce back up once you're done putting your stitch in. So you want to find that uh, uh, it's, it's, it'll be pretty obvious when you grab it with your instrument, which where it is stable and where it's not. And then just putting gel foam on both sides to, uh, to cover the rest of the brain and the, the, the bone is replaced back. This is what it looks like on ICG, and this is what it looks like on a Trix image. You can see the direct bypass going directly to an M4 vessel, and, uh, and very good. This is some more Trix imaging showing that. Um, <clears throat> sometimes patients have had surgery before. They've had surgery 10 years ago, now they have another stroke. So, you know, uh, sometimes it could be poor technique uh, from the prior surgery, or it could just be that their disease is just progressing at a rapid pace and you have to help these patients because your, ultimately your goal of surgery is to avoid them from getting more strokes. And every stroke, uh, any stroke is a bad stroke. I don't uh, care uh, how you uh, slice it. So you can use burr holes uh, as a salvage therapy, one to 24 per hemisphere. And, uh, and this can be one way of, of, of handling it. And if you've had a patient uh, or mental transposition, I don't have any experience with this, but this has been reported in the literature where you can take momentum and do a, a flap on top of the brain. But these are obviously very advanced cases that have failed all therapies. If you, uh, endovascular therapy is not very effective in Moya Moya. And if you look, there's been a recent paper uh, from a few years ago out of uh, San Francisco where they looked at the trends of uh, bypass surgery in the United States. And for aneurysms and uh, IC occlusion, the numbers have gone down. But for Moya Moya, it's gone up. So this is one of those uh, things where, I, uh, this is really one of the disease conditions where bypass has uh, really uh, shined and continues to shine. 
And I think it, 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 the, the results that are being published all over the world are, are a testament to how if you do good surgery for Moya, patients do very well and they can, they can, um, they, they'll respond to your surgery. Now, uh, complications, you can have reperfusion injury, um, bleeding, of course, uh, any part of the brain. Um, bypass occlusion, this is again, it can be technical or it could be uh, like the type one and type two I showed you before. It could be because maybe the brain doesn't need the uh, bypass at this point and then it'll occlude. Um, and then uh, if you have bad technique or if there is a, uh, your, your bypass occlusion, you can have up to a 78% uh, stroke rate. So don't be afraid of complications. If you're, if you're tackling these cases, uh, you have to uh, look at yourself in the mirror and, and, and share your experience with people so they don't make the same mistake. And um, this is an example of uh, a, a, a young man, a teenager who has sickle cell disease. And uh, he was undergoing, um, um, uh, he had undergone, bone, he was being treated for bone marrow transplant. So he was on rejection medication. You can see those are extremely, um, strong medications. Uh, he's very immunosuppressed. He developed moi moi. He had a stroke. We did a surgery. Surgery went fine, but several weeks later, you can see he, he's just he broke apart. And this is uh, taken care of by of a simple revision. I just uh, the important thing is don't uh, um, don't try to say oh that'll get better. Let's check out in a week because in two weeks this may be double the size, and now you won't be in a position to just oppose the skin edges. And in that case, you have to. Uh, potentially uh, talk to your plastic surgery colleagues. Uh, the patient may be a candidate for a flap. So you know, these are things just to think about because when you have a complication, that's okay. It's how you handle the complication that's important. So that that is a that is going to be a, 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 what guides you through these tough times. And I can talk to your friends, of course, and get some some advice uh, if you're in tough. This this case. I mean, I can go on with how many mistakes I see here, but you can see the, the two aneurysm clips here. And these small branch, I was trying to use this clip to block that off so it doesn't, and I have, you can see there's a gel foam where it's lying down like, like a head on a pillow. And I'm trying to bring my bypass graft in and this, this is uh, sitting there and I'm like, oh, I wanna get that out of the way. And the minute I move it, you see how it changes. All of a sudden it's blood, it's just blood. Very frustrating. Um, uh, obviously, I, the, uh, I, I used the wrong clip, but then you can see the corridor. I'm, I'm working between these two clips. And I kept thinking to myself, why would I do that? Why, why I should have made that a lot wider. And also to make things worse, this patient's uh, middle serve uh, artery recipient uh, was very poor quality. I, I sensed that even before cutting the vessel. So again, in retrospect, I probably would not have done bypass that. I probably would have looked for a different recipient. So that's what I learned from this case. The patient did fine, uh, but it just goes to show when these things happen, especially during surgery, you're by you're by yourself or with your partner. Yeah, you know this is this is a uh, you know this is not who wants to be a millionaire where you can call your friend. You have to figure it out and fix the problem and and take care of things. So so this is a uh, <clears throat> left craniotomy in a, in a young kid with moya moya. We used the uh, both branches are identified. Again, this is the technique to harvest the STA using, I'm using the microscope here, you can see it moving. This is the frontal STA. One point I forgot to mention, when you're harvesting the STA, use a pen and mark the top of the, the dorsal surface of the vessel, like here. This way it doesn't twist. Because after your bypass, if, you're, if your bypass twists, you have failed. So, and this is filling it up, it just fills up like an anaconda. Uh, with heparinized saline. And uh, here we're preserving the middle meningeal artery. I've kept the parietal branch in situ and uh, using very fine, pick up the arachnoid and cut the arachnoid. I'm trying, this is the recipient vessel that we're seeing here. Cut the arachnoid very carefully, take your time, um, uh, very gentle movements. Spend a lot of time here. You want to, uh, you want to create a nice white background so you can have the contrast and take the adventitia very, very, cleanly and safely. And you'll see the assistant is, my assistant is completely uh, irrigating the field. It has to be wet. And that glistening uh, adventitia will come into view and it has a slightly purplish uh, color. Uh, this vessel is about a millimeter wide. I think we're measuring it. Yeah, we're measuring it. You can see it's about a millimeter wide. Find your, this is a, uh, find your recipient right here. You can see, compared to the last slide, you can see how there's much more length here. 
So just you know, the, uh, you 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 do your uh, uh, heel stitch and toe stitch. I put I have isolated the arteriotomy, and this is a standard eleven blade. If you're not comfortable, you can use a twenty five gauge needle. Uh, and then uh, there's also pot scissors to do this, but I usually use a, a micro scissor. And uh, you can see the the this is now the um, toe stitch going in. It's a ten o needle. <clears throat> and uh, once you get that stitch in, you have to uh, start. I do an interrupted suture on both sides. Um, uh, theoretically, these tend to grow over time as opposed to continuous. And if you have made a mistake with the interrupted suture, you can always take it out. And you can see how I'm lifting up the edge here. You want to get the adventitia, uh, the sorry, the intimal layers opposed like this, not like this. And uh, <clears throat> make your make the tail of your uh, suture small so it's easier to tie. You don't want to go up and down on the field. You want to come be as close to the vessel so you can and uh, and the tie it uh, and uh, stay in one area. You can see the, all the actions taken care of right next to, to the vessel. And you can see there's multiple sutures on either side uh, of the vessel, about uh, eight to eight to nine. And then once this is done, I like to zoom out with the uh, foot pedal and then zoom back in this way. Uh, because you're working on a very high manifest, you don't want to injure something on the way in. And then once you're uh, done with your bypass, you can see it's pumping away. That's a good sign. But just because it's pumping doesn't mean that it's flowing. You have to check it. And this is the uh, this is the insight to one. You can see the the flow is going through uh, very well. And in this ICG, you can also see the different uh, stitches, uh, the little black dots where the stitches are. And uh, that's the rest of the video. The other vessel we used it for a uh, um, indirect bypass. So with bypass surgery, uh, patient selection is paramount. Uh, please plan accordingly. Um, Whenever I plan these surgeries, these are elective cases, I am never on call the night before. So there's no way I'm waking up in the middle of the night doing a hemicraniectomy or decompression or taking out a clot and then coming back three hours later to a bypass because you're tired. Um, so you have to be very well rested and, and plan these cases uh, as your day goes and pick your team. Uh, the, just, just as you notice, there's so many steps in these surgeries and just as you get better, your team will get better. So trying to find a few people that you want to, it's not like you're doing hundreds of these surgeries a year. So you want to you wanna have very good results. So pick a team and then keep it consistent so your results also stay consistent. And remember, flow augmentation is a goal. You are not replacing flow here, you're augmenting it. So use your judgment. Don't be uh, um, enamored by direct, indirect. They all work, but it's what works best in your hands. Um, uh, the direct bypass will give you immediate reperfusion, and it has been shown to increase the uh, 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 cerebral blood flow and uh, vasoreactivity over time. And uh, so that's why I've, I've done both for pretty much all my patients uh, over the last several years. And dedicate time for training. You can go to a lab. You can do this uh, with a chicken wing vessel, but use a microscope and try to find if you uh, finished a bypass surgery, you have leftover needles, don't throw it away. Recycle it, take it back to the lab, practice. And soon you'll be able to do these one hand stands and have some food like these guys here for fun. And then, and then you'll enjoy it. So, but the, the journey can be a little arduous, but trust me, um, it's, it's, it's very gratifying when, when these cases go well and especially when the patients do very well. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for listening. Please uh, this time stay safe and healthy and uh, um, I'll take your questions if you have any. Okay, thank you very much, Abhilash. Excellent. Uh, and we have a lot of panelists here today, so uh, we'll open it up for questions. Uh, if your internet connection is not great, you can text questions in the chat box. Uh, and so the floor is open. Hopefully, we use this to interact this platform. I'll get you off, Abhilash. I'll get you off the screen share. Okay. okay. Let me uh, just. Okay, very good. Okay, the floor is open. I have access to the, uh, you can even type in your question if you have it, I can see the questions. Go ahead, uh, go ahead, Daddy. Yeah, yeah, uh, Dr. Yeah. Uh, 
I can that, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, um, Arindas. I, I, I really appreciated your uh, demonstrations. I don't do a lot of bypass uh, here, uh, basically because of um, well, resource uh, challenges. Uh, it's, Fukushima. It's Nigeria, right? Nigeria, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Fukushima uh, taught me uh, a lot of um, bypass techniques uh, when I had to look at them, but it's been a bit difficult. Then you have to have uh, good patient selection before one begins to go at that. But when they present late and then patients are not uh, financially, uh, you know, up to it, then it becomes difficult to do those things. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and on a lighter note, you said uh, you can't phone a friend. Sometimes you might need to phone a friend. <laughs> if you, if you are. Yeah, very true. If you if you if you run into trouble, uh, an extra hand may just help. Thank <laughs> you very, very much. Thank you, uh, thank you, Doctor Kane, for your comments and uh, appreciate that. I think uh, with these cases, uh, you have to uh, keep an open mind, and uh, I completely agree. Uh, many places do it very differently, and uh, but uh, at the same time. Uh, Ultimately, if, if, as long as the goal is the same, like we are all here to learn, um, it doesn't matter uh, how you approach it, as long as your intention is, is very clear. And of course, most importantly, the patient does well. So thank you for your comments. There's Thanks. one question here about, uh, from Dr. Siddharth Agarwal regarding the cut flow index. So the cut flow index, uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't highlight it here for time, but Basically, when you have the STA, you, uh, the initial step is to, you have to have the Charbel flow probe. So you have to have that um, in your hospital. And uh, this probe will measure the, uh, the flow within the vessel uh, of the cut STA. So that's, that's number one. Number two, once you're done with your bypass, you measure flow through, the, through your bypass. And then you divide those two numbers and that gives you the index. So if you have an index over 0.5, that's excellent. So if your bypass when you cut it is supplying 10 cc's uh, per minute and after your bypass is providing 10 cc's per minute, that's an index of one, which means that your patency is going to be, your bypass is going to survive uh, based on the uh, literature on cut flow index. Uh, now, um, uh, I'm not saying that every uh, surgeon uh, uses the cut flow index, but if you have this ability, this is just another uh, 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 parameter you can use to uh, highlight uh, validity in your cases, and also uh, to give you a confidence that, uh, that your bypass is uh, most likely going to uh, uh, stand the test of time. Now, of course, if your bypass fails over time, you can always look retrospectively and see uh, and question the cut flow index or, or find out if your technique was bad, but that comes under the type two error. Okay. More comments, questions? Yes, there's a question from Dr. Uh, um, Arun. Um, the, uh, if the M4, I mean, the, the question is about M4, so we're talking about the recipient vessel. Um, one very important point, which I didn't mention in my talk, is in Moya Moya, uh, splitting the Slovian fissure is probably one of the most difficult, it's probably one of the most difficult Sylvian splits to do, and I highly recommend it not doing it. Um, so if you're going to look for a vessel, look for an M4 vessel, at most an M3. Do not go to the M2. I have personally not done that, but because the brain is, is, is not a normal brain. It's, it's a brain that is, uh, is, uh, has misery perfusion and it's very hyperemic. So if you try to dissect with the fissure, you may have bleeding all over the place, and then uh, it'll be very discouraging. So um, uh, if your M4 recipient doesn't look healthy, definitely do a, do an EDAS. Or you can just lay your vessel directly on the brain and do a PLC angiosis. Uh, so it's very important. Sometimes I keep both vessels uh, in continuity, identify my recipient before cutting it. So these are all different ways uh, you will develop. After your, after your first couple, you'll see, um, you'll, you'll start to... Uh, um, look at the nuances a little bit more closely. That's at least what happened to me. Uh, you can look at videos all you want, but when you start, once you start doing these cases, you realize there's a lot that 
uh, uh, comes out from from uh, from uh, serendipity or just uh, or just uh, from from operating on a regular basis. And of course, when the when the bypass takes, um, uh, it, it's 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 very uh, reassuring. Now, with uh, another thing with the M4, uh, don't be. Uh, you can look at your M4 vessels on your preoperative uh, angiogram or your CTA, and uh, use that as a guide. Sometimes the M4 and the veins look the same. They both look red. Uh, this is another trick. Um, if your uh, M4 vessel and your vein looks red, you're going to be thinking, which one do I isolate? You don't want to. You don't want anastomose to a vein. So in that case, do an ICG run. You know, and you know, the arteries will light up first, followed by the veins. So that's a little trick. Or, or you can try to use a Doppler, but I, I found ICG very, very helpful. It's one of the few times where I actually give ICG before the bypass. Um, and, and, and that's one thing. So another uh, question from Dinoosh45 is, what precautions will you take while doing, sorry, what is the different indication for high flow and low flow bypass? Excellent question. So the key word in that question is flow. Flow, flow, flow. The goal of surgery is to promote flow. In Moya Moya, the goal is almost always low flow bypass. We are looking for just augmenting flow. We're not trying to replace the flow for the entire hemisphere. The time you use a high flow bypass is if you're going to sacrifice, uh, you're doing a huge MC aneurysm and you, know, you want to uh, uh, proximally occlude or isolate the aneurysm, or if you are doing a retrograde uh, thrombosis of the aneurysm, that's where the high flow bypass comes in. I have some videos of that, uh, which is uh, obviously not this talk, but uh, uh, very, very different pathology. That is not moya moya. So that's where you use a high flow bypass. So it's very, very distinct for that category of patients. Moya moya is an augmentation procedure. You're augmenting flow. Augmenting does not mean replacing completely. So a low flow bypass is all you need. That's why sometimes all you need is muscle. You don't have to go and, and if you're not comfortable doing a direct bypass, if that's not uh, uh, within your armamentarium. Uh, thank you <laughs> from, from Bangladesh, nice. Um, hey, more what, what should be done accidentally if we end up doing complete artery army recipient vessel? Excellent question. So uh, I, I have uh, not encountered this myself, but I've seen it happen to, to someone else. And I'll tell you, um, um, it is really hard because when you make a, first of all, the M4 can be a millimeter, maybe 0.8 millimeters. But if you have a two millimeter uh, M4 recipient and you make an opening in the opening in the back, in the back, in the back, other way around it. You can't put fluid so you can't put gel foam. Uh, you definitely should not fill it with anything. So you should put a stitch in it, but, and, and keep it very, very, uh, you definitely use a 10 and That's how I would fix it. Uh, do you use contralateral STA if ipsilateral side is not available? The, I, I have not, uh, I have not uh, used the contralateral STA or attempted a, uh, um, you know, of course, with, with contralateral STA, what comes to my mind is the Bonnet bypass, which uh, uh, Dr. Bashkaya gave a fantastic presentation. I, uh, if any of you missed it, you should watch it from a few weeks ago but the Bonnet bypass. But no, I, I think in that case, I would tell the patient that we would just do an indirect uh, bypass. You can potentially also see if the posterior auricular artery is available. Uh, we don't talk about that much, but that's behind the ear. And see if you can flip it anterior to, to, to help you with this. So um, uh, these are the, the different uh, tricks. Okay, I wonder if Dr. Goel, Dr. Goel, are you there? If he'd like to comment. Um, he may have stepped away. Okay, the floor is open for anyone else that wants to say hello or just ask a pointed question or comment. John? Oh, go to the end, Dr. Well, how are you doing today? Very well, John. Nice to see you and great presentation, Abhilash. Thank you, sir. Moya, Thank Moya, you. Moya, Moya is indeed uh, quite a... Uh, quite an issue and there are various issues and what you suggested is the key word is the flow. Flow is not there and you have to introduce the flow. That is the key word. And how you introduce that flow 
is by various maneuvers as you have suggested. I am also studying this subject for quite some time and I'm having a little bit of an alternative viewpoint which I will discuss maybe after one year or two years because I'm still developing this uh, concept of a, a little different viewpoint. Mm. So I don't want to disturb you too much in the current <laughs> whatever you are saying, <laughs> but you are, you know, indeed you have shown some beautiful bypasses and beautiful basic uh, things in this. And I wish you all the best, dear Abhilash. Thank you, Professor Goel. Always a pleasure and honor speaking with you. Thank you. Thank you, Abhilash. Thank you. We'll be going on to Dr. Goel in a few minutes. Any more questions or comments from the panelists? Don't be afraid. It's a tool to have interaction. That's the, that's the best part about it. People are quiet today, Dr. Goel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. I guess we'll move on. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Avalash, and we look forward to okay. having more presentations uh, from you in the future.